Hi, welcome to the KubeCon Europe uh, session from the Kubernetes IoT Edge Working Group. I'm Steve Wong. I'm a co-chair of the IoT Edge Working Group. Uh, I'm employed as a software engineer working on Kubernetes by VMware, and I'm coming to you in this recording from Los Angeles, California. Hello, my name is Dan. I'm a software engineer with Earth Hit. I'm also a, a, a colleague of, of Kubernetes IoT Edge Working Group and coming from Belgrade, Serbia. So here's today's agenda. Uh, we're gonna give contact information and a link to the deck at the end. Uh, I'm gonna start with a really quick overview of what's different about communications for edge applications and edge devices. Then we're gonna move on with an introduction to some technology called LoRa, along with uh, network architecture based on it called LoRaWAN. About halfway through, Dion is going to take over with a talk on the Drogue Cloud project followed by a demo. Hopefully you'll like the talk. And if you do, we're gonna wrap up with details on how you can become a member of the Kubernetes IoT Edge Working Group where we host ongoing discussions on subjects like what's in this talk. Um, edge applications uh, are often isolated, but they're generally going to be part of a bigger picture multi-tier architecture if Kubernetes is involved. You know, if you're using standalone edge devices that don't talk to anything else, you're unlikely to really have Kubernetes involved. But if you, are connecting up edge devices to feed into applications and servers on a regional or global basis. Uh, that's going to be the scenario where it makes sense to utilize Kubernetes. And that's what we're gonna be here to address today. So if you try to do um, communications at edge, the same way it's done in a large cloud data center, be prepared for some challenges and even a few roadblocks, particularly in mobile uh, and in remote places that have wiring difficulties. Uh, Radio-based communication is an alternative to hardwired. And we're all familiar with the radio-based options like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and LTE. Today, we're gonna talk about another wireless option, LoRa. Uh, LoRa, by the way, stands for long range. Of course, this conference is also about Kubernetes. So we're also going to show how information or events can be collected from edge nodes to feed Kubernetes hosted apps. Uh, I'm going to start with a technical overview and then later Dan will move on to cover the Drogue project. So we're all familiar with Wi-Fi, which is an example of a local area network. Uh, its reach is limited to perhaps tens or low hundreds of meters. Uh, wide area networks bridge much longer distances. There are always limits imposed by physics. So what you have here in this uh, chart showing uh, support uh, of these different technologies measured in bandwidth versus range, um, is going to face a, a situation where you've got to choose the rec, right technology for the job. No technology provides all the attributes at once. For example, there isn't a technology that has maximum bandwidth at the same time it has maximum range. Um, and by the way, this graph is two dimensions. So it only compares bandwidth versus range and it's missing an important third dimension, which is power consumption. Uh, with regard to power consumption, older people remember AM radio stations, which could carry for huge distances, particularly at night. These AM radio stations use tens of kilowatts of power. So even a hundred years ago, people had figured out how to go long distances using high power. But what if you want to go long distances using low power uh, as something you might have available in a low powered uh, battery device? Um, LoRa is a technology that uses something called chirp modulation, 
which is capable of communicating at low power on potentially congested unlicensed spectrum. Instead of using a constant base frequency, it uses rising and falling pitch as a basis for transmission. It's robust against interference because it can filter out anything that doesn't have the rising and lowering pitch characteristics and ignore it. Uh, interestingly enough, this changing pitch concept is something that's used in nature by whales, dolphins, and bats. Um, one important thing to notice, by the way, is that with LoRa, the frequency used, unlike Wi-Fi, is not globally harmonized. Uh, this is because it uses unlicensed spectrum, and in different parts of the world, the unlicensed spectrum falls into different frequency bands. Uh, we don't have time today to go into a deeper dive detail about LoRa, but uh, it features something called a link budget. And this is a budget that can be spent either to achieve long range or better than average penetration through building walls or a little of each at the same time. And this is very important when you're dealing with a low power uh, radio technology. Um, this is an example of a device that we're going to demo later in this talk uh, to give you an idea of what's out there. Uh, this is one that I bought here in the US called an Adafruit Feather. Uh, the device features 300 microamps of power consumption while it's asleep. At its peak during transmission at maximum power, this can go up to 120 milliamps of power consumption. And it would average about 40 milliamps of power consumption during active radio listening. Uh, there are alternate forms of LoRa that might even use less power. Uh, but these are potentially devices that could operate on a battery uh, for as long as a year if you vigorously engaged in uh, going into deep sleep and waking a device up only when you needed to measure or transmit something. Uh, so far, we've only talked about the radio link from the device to whatever it links to, and that would be LoRa. Um, but even though LoRa stands for long range, long range here isn't infinite. You know, let's call it line of sight up to 10 kilometers for common use cases, and LoRa is the physical layer. Um, yeah, LoRa is the radio plus the LoRa modulation, but... Uh, in a practical scenario, you would often want to go longer distances than even the tens of kilometers. So uh, what you do here is put together a big picture architecture. And if you compare this to what you've got in physical ethernet links, um, the physical ethernet can be used to build a point to point link but this isn't really a practical network in an ethernet scenario. You need to bring in switches, routers, higher level protocols and management tooling. Um, you also, you need these sorts of things that, so that you can join devices together with other things. Uh, going back to the early ethernet days, the, somebody called Metcalf proposed something called Metcalf's law that says that the value of the network goes up with the square of the number of connected nodes. LoRa is no different. We need to add a few more things to make this super valuable. And what's shown in this slide is something called LoRaWAN. It defines a communication protocol and a system architecture for a network using LoRa to connect the devices, along with allowing alternate transports like IP up at higher levels. Uh, LoRaWAN is managed by the LoRa Alliance, which is an open nonprofit association that currently has over 500 members. LoRaWAN is designed to incur very little overhead for a device to simply be present on a network. So it's great for devices that are usually in deep sleep most of the time to save power. Uh, note that you can have devices that have LoRa, but also have Wi-Fi at the same time and selectively use Wi-Fi on an as-needed basis under 
relatively rare circumstances, once again, to save power. Um, an example of a LoRaWAN network is the Things Network, which we're going to use later in the network demo. Uh, this is a global cloud sourced example of the implementation of a LoRaWAN network, but it's possible to run your own private LoRaWAN network rather than to join into these uh, alternatives like crowdsourced implementations or commercial implementations. Um, so today we're going to use the Things Network, and this is commonly abbreviated as TTM. Uh, so as part of this LoRaWAN architecture, moving from devices at the left, you uh, have these connected to gateways. The LoRaWAN gateway receives LoRa modulated RF mo messages from any end device that's within hearing distance and forwards these data messages up to the LoRaWAN network server that is just to the right of the gateways. Uh, there's no fixed association between an end device and a specific gateway. Instead, the same sensor could be served by multiple gateways in the area. The gateways operate entirely at the physical layer, and in essence, they're nothing but LoRa radio message forward. They only check the data integrity of LoRa RF messages. If the CRC is incorrect, the messages drop. Otherwise, the gateway forwards it up to the network server together with some metadata that includes the received signal strength and an optional timestamp. For downlinks, a gateway executes transmission requests coming from the uh, network server without any interpretation of the payload. It's just forwarding it on. Since multiple gateways could be in a position to receive the same LoRa RF message from a single end device, the uh, LoRaWAN network server performs data deduplication and deletes all copies, typically saving the version that came from the gateway that reported the highest signal strength. The LoRaWAN network server, the LNS, manages network and establishes secure AES connections for the transport from end devices to user applications in the cloud. The network server cannot see or access application data, or at least can't access it in, in clear text. So here's a wrap of what we've learned. We've got some, we've got a technology called LoRa and higher level protocol built upon it called LoRaWAN. The suitable use cases for this are use cases where you need long range in multiple kilometers. And with that LoRaWAN backbone, you, you can go worldwide on this stuff. Um, the best use cases are ones that demand low power. And this is capable of supporting devices that could last a year or more on a, uh, on a single battery change. Um, it also supports low cost devices. And we're here we're talking about 60 euro, euros of CapEx per node and tiny amounts of operational expense. Uh, they are constrained uh, to have low bandwidth. So there are clearly use cases that demand higher bandwidth that aren't suitable, but for things like event or um, measurement reporting that are in the range of reports once every five minutes or even less frequently uh, demanding bandwidths in the range shown in this slide, this is a good match. Uh, coverage is achievable essentially everywhere. If not, uh, if there's not already a, a gateway in the area, you can add your own. And the, just like the devices are low cost, these, uh, LoRaWAN gateways are also relatively low cost. Um, it does feature 128-bit encryption, and uh, the higher-level network server can integrate data and event streams to apps using TCP, MQTT, HTTP, cloud events, etc. What's not suitable uh, for LoRaWAN? Real-time data. It can only send devices in small packets every few minutes, 
not continuous data streams. You can't use this for phone calls. Uh, you should use it, uh, something like LTE instead. Uh, it's nominally, at least in the LoRaWAN case, not designed for home automation. Although Semtech does have some alternate technology uh, for uh, operating a private LoRa net that can be used for home automation. Also not useful for sending photos, watching videos. You'd want to use Wi-Fi here. Thanks, Steve. So uh, we come with, with an idea to, to, to bring two worlds together with, with the Drog IoT Cloud. Uh, the, the, the rising interest in, in using uh, Rust programming language to, uh, uh, to, to do uh, embedded work and, and, and on the other side to do a, a serverless uh, on, on the cloud side is what uh, brought us to, to try to bring this, this, this uh, two, two worlds together. So, so the Drog IoT project is all about uh, providing on one side the tools for, for embedded developers to use async Rust framework uh, to, to, to do firmwares and also uh, try to use off the shelf uh, platform built on, on top of the, the K native eventing uh, and, and try to build a, a, a seamless experience for people to, 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 go, to build end to end uh, applications. So, just a, a couple of words about the drug device. Uh, it, it's, it, it tries to provide an, an actor framework for, for, for embedded, uh, embedded devices. Uh, meaning that that uh, developers will will uh, have a concept of actors uh, uh, communicating and isolating their their context and, and their their state by uh, by passing messages uh, between b between each other. Uh, on the other side, uh, the draw cloud is built on on uh, as I said on on top of the Kubernetes K native and cloud events. We also uh, you are, are using uh, cloud native Rust to build uh, the, the accompanied services, as, as we will see at the moment. And as you know, uh, uh, K native eventing supports multiple uh, uh, brokering and, and uh, messaging options as, as a back, uh, backing uh, technology. Uh, we prefer uh, Apache Kafka for, for data plane and, and, and the message passing uh, through the system, as, as we will see. So. If we look at the data plan and, and, and how things uh, 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 look on this side, at the last session at, at, at the KubeCon North America, we talked in, in, in detail about the theory of, of using K-native eventing and, and the cloud events uh, uh, for, for, for IoT use cases. And I encourage you to take a look at that video if, if, you, if you're interested more in, into, into that topic. Here we can see that, that uh, from the central part of this system, we have a K-native and, and Kafka as a, as, as a, as a core of, 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 uh, of this uh, serverless IoT solution. But we need a, a lot more services to make this really a, a, a usable off-the-shelf uh, IoT cloud platform. So if, if we go on, on the uh, southbound side, or on the device side, we need a, a lot of devices uh, uh, connecting uh, to the to the uh, to, to our our K native, and for that we need a, a protocol endpoints. For example, uh, you know, trans, trans, uh, transforming uh, the MQTT messages or or you know the Things Network uh, uh, payloads, as we will see soon. In, into the, the, the cloud events and, and pushing it to, to the K native, uh, K -native channels. But also we need uh, a, a device authentication in our authorization uh, so, so that we know uh, uh, that devices we are communicating uh, with are actually our devices. On the other side, if you take a look at, at things, uh, uh, we, we also need to provide a way for for to have a, a user authentication and, and authorization, uh, meaning that that uh, you know 
we, we need to authorize the access to, to, to the streams of, of messages uh, coming coming uh, to and from from our, our devices, right? But even if, if we if we uh, have that, uh, assuming that everything runs in in a single uh, single Kubernetes cluster, we can deal with with providing appropriate serverless services to 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 deal with, with our data, but. You know, having all this as, as a hosted solution and, and, and potentially have, having IoT applications running in, in different clusters, then the cluster that, that is hosting uh, uh, the, the draw cloud, we need to provide different uh, different integration uh, 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 different integration endpoints. For example, you know, the most usual ones are that, that people will usually uh, either consuming data directly from the Kafka. Uh, and for that, we will probably use something like, like uh, a service binding operator to expose that Kafka uh, cluster to, to the outside world and, and to, to the other clusters. Or, you know, most IoT developers are very familiar with MQTT, so, so we can pr provide them with an, with an uh, option to, to subscribe uh, to, to the draw cloud uh, as it, it was an, an MQTT broker. And, in in a, in a final case, you know, using the web sockets uh, to develop uh, web applications is is something that that's very very common in this uh, in, in this in this space. From the from the com control plane side, uh, in order to have uh, all this authentication and authorization both on the devices side and, and on the applications and the user sides, uh, we need to have some kind of a, a central registry of of identities. And that's identities for for the devices and identities for 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 the users. For for the users and applications, we we, we basically use and the single sign-on instance based on on the OAuth, backed by the by the Kiko project, and uh, we pro provide a, a data device management API, which allows us to to use a, a, a UI or or CLIs to 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 actually uh, manage our, our device data as you will see in the in the moment. Uh, one more in, important uh, uh, part of this is is the change events uh, as we see on the arrow here. A typical uh, typical uh, IoT solution never consists of, of, of a single project. It, it's a distributed system by by the nature, and each of these systems has its own uh, their own registry of, of 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 identities that needs to be to be managed the idea uh, 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 behind the change events is to basically have uh, have a, a, a change event uh, stream that will be able to to provide uh, operators and controllers controllers on so that we can we can uh, sync multiple multiple registries so for example in the future it, it will be possible that once you you're, you're you know uh, set your device in the draw cloud that that device uh, and and you you you, you uh, annotate that device that it's a it's a thing network device that your things network uh, 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 service will, will be configured out, out automatically uh, uh, by by the system so let's talk a little bit about uh, types of devices that, that that we have and, and, and what we will use in, in the demo today. So uh, the simplest way is to have a, a, a single device connecting directly to the to, to the cloud, right? That, that's a simple possible case. In some cases, uh, as Steve mentions, for example, using using the, the BLE or, 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 or ZigWave, we have devices that, that are not capable of, of reaching out the, the, the public internet for, and in that case, we need to have some kind of the gateway, uh, basically doing an IP onboarding of, of that device and, and being able to 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 out be authorized by the cloud to send and and receive uh, data in, in in behalf of of, of device, and the, the most complicated case and and the one that that we will. We, we set our minds on today is is some kind of uh, uh, long long range uh, scenario with, with LoRa, where we have a device, we have a gateway, and that gateway 
talk to some kind of a, a, a service things uh, network we, we can call it uh, the 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 you know iot cloud gateway in, in this case which is from from the cloud perspective actually uh, a device and it's authorized to to send uh, data on on behalf behalf of uh, of a device so let's see how all this works in in a in a, in a very sim simple simple demo so uh, we have a uh, uh, that uh, device that, that uh, steve showed sitting in in his home in la right uh, configured properly in 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 the in the things network uh, console so so here 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 is device uh and uh, what we need to do in order to to connect it to the cloud is actually to 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 connect uh, this uh, uh, this device uh, as an uh, as an as an uh, as an uh, device in 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 the draw cloud and for that we need to do a, a proper in integration in this case we will use an http integration and and you know simply configure it that for every message that that the the things service uh, receives from device it, it will forward to our, our our cloud solution and for that we need to specify a, a couple of uh, parameters which is like an url the authorization it will use and, and we will see that 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 in in the moment but you can see that that we already here we, we have a, at, at two different identities so we we have an identity of the things network uh, service that that authorizes itself and that's that's our application here and the actual device uh, belonging to that application that that will send uh, data data to the cloud draw cloud uh, we will use for for this demo uh, uh we will use the sandbox of the draw cloud which, which comes with, with a with a, a simple console and and we will see how to use the cli at the moment so what, what we need to do here in in order to make it make all this work is basically uh, a, a create an, an appropriate uh, a, a appropriate uh, sorry about this uh, to create appropriate uh, data in, in in our device registry for starters we are creating our applications so so that's the the concept of of the draw cloud which allows us to group multiple devices in, into a simple in, into a simple uh, single single application next we will create an actual device we will call call it the the ttn service and it it will represent uh, represent our gateway our our, our service connecting to to the cloud and we will pass this uh, uh, set it up to be able to connect with with, with the appropriate uh, appropriate credentials and provide additional metadata uh, about uh, the payload it expects uh, from the device but our job here is not done because we also need to create uh, an actual representation of of the device that, that will send the data and you can see in, in this case that we are not specifying the credentials for for device but but we are just uh, saying that this device will connect to appropriate uh, uh, gateway which is the name of of the previously defined uh, device in the in the in, in the draw cloud now with all this properly set uh, we can actually uh, expect to receive uh data from 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 the from the dev uh, from the device uh steve device is uh, configured to send data every five minutes so hopefully it it, it, it will uh, we will not uh, wait that long for for for, for, the, for the next uh, for the next message the data let's give it a, a i think couple more seconds and things should should uh... well we'll cut this down when we edit the video but what was the timestamp on the last data and we should get another one five minutes after that 
I, I think it's it's just yeah. And here it is. Here's the data in the console, uh, as, uh, and uh, uh, here's the data in the in the MQTT client. And as you can see, the the in in the both uh, cases, the data is is a, a properly structured uh, a, a cloud event with it, with its own uh, uh, source and and the type. So, so that applications can can be easily written uh, and and uh, uh, consume this data for for further on. So, I'll get back uh, to Steve at, at at this point. Let me. Uh, you, you're muted, Steve. Thanks for that great demo. And just to point out my device here that I'm holding up is coming from Los Angeles and Dion and I are a 13, 13 hour flight away. So this is definitely long range, although Laura did carry it the bulk of that range. It, once it hit the things network, I think that it went over the backhaul. Um, so uh, if you like the presentation today and you like topics like uh, this uh, that relate to using Kubernetes for applications either running on the edge or supporting data and events collected from the edge uh, with Kubernetes hosted applications and services at a mezzanine tier or a, a cloud tier, uh, you should join this group. We have meetings twice a month. They're at alternating times. So we have one series uh, that is optimized for people in North America. And the North American meetings report repeat every four weeks. We have another series that was optimized for um, Asia, Asia, Eastern Europe. And once again, uh, those occur middle of the night if you're in North America, but a better time for other locations. And they repeat every four weeks. Uh, we've also got a, a Slack group uh, in addition to the meetings. So you can go on there and ask questions. The content at the user group meetings is intended to be user driven. So if you've got any subjects that you'd like to see presented on or talked about, uh, and you're a member, uh, we invite you to nominate topics. And uh, as co-chairs, we'll uh, attempt to drive that to please the user base. It's the next slide. So um, here's a link to where the deck is published on the SCED site. Uh, Dion and I are both on GitHub and we're both available in the Slack channel. Uh, we're going to hang around in case you have questions. So uh, thanks for attending.